Hey everybody, this is the final project for Respiratory Therapy School. Man, in this long time coming. Um, and instead of doing it on a just a particular case that I had, and we're going to talk about one single patient, but I wanted to use this as a broader platform to talk about using APRV in the non-lung injured patient. And is this a fight really worth having? And I know that a lot of people, when they go to clinicals, they go to work other places, They'll go some places like our hospital in Greenville where APRV is kind of everywhere. And they'll go to other places where they don't use it at all. Um, we had that experience at the Duke Symposium. We've had that experience at Wake where they just don't use it. And so I thought this was an important thing for us to talk about in terms of how widespread this is, not just in our state, but in our industry, and how useful it is. So <clears throat> we'll start with some facts, and I talk about this in the context of ARDS, since that's the most profound type of lung injury. And the first thing we'll start with is the Berlin definition of ARDS, and this came out in 2012. And the whole reason why this definition was refined was we had a lot of patients who were probably in ARDS before this who had some cardiac component. And ARDS is typically described as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And so if somebody had cardiogenic pulmonary edema, they were excluded from being having ARDS. And we now find out that that's just not true, is that plenty of patients who have a cardiac component can have ARDS. And so the Berlin definition um, included criteria which was both more broad and more narrow. So the Berlin definition includes respiratory failure within one week of a known insult, and we know that ARDS usually comes after something else. So they get septic and get ARDS, or they get a traumatic injury and surgery and ARDS. Um, the bilateral opacities on chest x-ray, or CT, not explained by effusion, and, spoiler alert, we're going to talk more about bilateral opacities in the current context of COVID-19. And respiratory failure not explained by cardiac function or volume overload, so something else is causing their lungs to shut down aside from easily explainable things. And the, the big money maker there is the PF ratio of less than 300. And of course we know from incessantly studying about this that we used to say that if the PF ratio was less than 300 that was acute lung injury. Now we just decide that all these things are indeed lung injury and now they're different categories of ARDS. So we have mild, moderate, and severe ARDS. So anything less than 300 is considered ARDS in whatever grade that is. Um, another important thing is that if somebody does progress to ARDS in the ICU, their mortality is like can be up to 60%. That's not really good. Um, so we can do better than that. And the problem is, is that the things we've done so far, like APRV, um, low tidal volume, and proning, haven't done a lot to really improve survival. So maybe there's something more we can do. And maybe that something is, we don't let the lungs get injured in the first place. And I know you guys have seen this in clinical um, and in practice, and I've seen it in the different ways that I've been, is that APRV tends to be something they do once somebody starts to have lung issues. And maybe, just maybe, if we would use it earlier, they wouldn't have lung issues in the first place. We'll see if that works. And there's, believe it or not, there is some data to support that. So the patient we use for this context, and the patient, I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you, is really less important than the idea. So this patient, 37-year-old guy, this uh, hospital day two diagnosed with intracranial hemorrhage, he was at home, experienced a sudden onset of severe headache for which he took um, over-the-counter meds, I think it was ibuprofen, went to sleep. Um, family found him approximately 30 minutes later snoring and unresponsive. Uh, EMS brought him to the outside hospital. He received imaging which showed an enormous left intraparenchymal cranial hemorrhage. He was intubated for airway protection and transferred to a tertiary care center, in this case, um, Vidant, for neurosurge. Um, his history is about what you would expect, uh, hypertensive, coronary artery disease, and he is completely non-compliant. A uh, little side note to this, Family reported that um, his estranged wife, or his wife had become estranged, had left him, 
and so he had really become non-compliant, really fallen off with his diet, didn't take his meds, that kind of thing. Um, smoked, great thing to add to that. And his family history was one of malignant hypertension, especially on his father's side. And his father died at about age 45, also from a stroke. Um, this all came from the family, so it was a little nebulous, but you can kind of see the picture we're, we're painting here. <clears throat> um, in the bed there, he is obese, ill-appearing. He's still intubated uh, when I saw him. And he is on APRV. Now, he's on APRV because of where he is, most likely. But his settings, uh, T-high was 5 seconds, T-low is 0.5. His P high is 28, P low is zero, which is pretty common, and his FiO2 is 30%. Now, what this paints a picture of when you look at his FiO2 is that he's not having trouble oxygenating because they're not trying that hard. And if you look at his blood gas, you can see that he's 74429 uh, uh, CO2, 19 bicarb, PO2 is 137 on 30%. And, of course, he sat in 100%. His PF ratio is a whopping 456. Um, in case you're doing the math, our man does not have ARDS. <clears throat> now, just some background about what intracranial hemorrhage looks like. Uh, the intracranial blood vessels get weakened by hypertension or malformation or trauma, usually hypertension in the population that we see. And the vessels rupture. One or more of them rupture, usually just one. And the rupture allows blood to flow into the cranial vault. Now, a couple things happen when that, when that happens is, first of all, if blood is flowing into the cranial vault, it is not flowing to the brain. And so there is areas of the brain that become starved. The second part is, as blood leaks into the intracranial vault, we have a situation where you have increased intracranial pressure. Um, this goes back to something you may have heard about in anatomy class, the Monroe-Kelly Doctrine. <clears throat> where it said there's room for three things in your head and that is brain which is 80 percent blood which is 10 percent and cerebrospinal fluid which is the other 10 percent and if any of those things go up one of the other has to go down so and just because your brain or your cranium rather is a closed box and so in his case blood goes way way up not where it's supposed to be and so brain and cerebral spinal fluid start to go down, and even the blood that's supposed to be there starts to go down because all this extra blood's taken up space. So you end up with increased intracranial pressure. But important thing about intracranial hemorrhage is that unless they aspirate either after the event or they aspirate during airway management or something like that, they don't have any lung involvement. So this is the greatest patient in the world to evaluate for using a different kind of ventilator strategy in a patient who doesn't have any lung injury because he shouldn't have any lung injury. <clears throat> so this gets us to lung protective ventilation. Now just in the name we should think about what lung protective ventilation really is. It's not lung therapeutic ventilation. It's not meant to heal the lungs. It's meant to prevent the lungs from getting sick. And in my own personal opinion, and the data suggests this, which is in the paper, we spend a lot of time practicing lung protective ventilation in patients whose lungs are already injured. And that's not the way to do it. That's like putting on a Band-Aid after you've hacked off your arm with a chainsaw. It doesn't work. So we use things like low tidal volumes, low FiO2s, things like that, things we know which cause problems. And ARDSNET you know, set the standard for this, and that's what we've been following for all this time. But we know now that it's an uphill battle if we allow these lungs to get sick through high pressures, high volumes, barotrauma, volutrauma, and oxygen toxicity. But if we would just use if we would just use this for the patients who weren't lung injured in the first place. And so one of the things that they came up with was Airway Pressure Release Ventilation, or APRV. APRV has been around um, almost 40 years. It's been commercially available since about the 90s. Most of the bigger ICU events will do it or some form of it, um, and unlike some of the other trade names, they all call it APRV. Um, and it's described in two different ways. It's described in a very serious way, and it's described in a very benign way. 
the serious way it's described as a form of inverse ratio pressure control ventilation, which is true. It's also described as a form of CPAP, which sounds very benign. Um, and in fact, it is both of these things because if you have somebody who's not breathing at all, you can set up APRV to be 100% inverse ratio pressure control ventilation. If you have somebody who is quite awake and quite breathing, that's a lot of the patients you're going to find in like some of the neuro floors where they do this for everybody. Then those patients are completely awake, breathing, and they are breathing over top of these pressures using it just like CPAP. The idea, whichever way it works, is that it maintains alveolar recruitment, but maybe the most important thing is that it prevents cyclical derecruitment of the alveoli. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is in the references, that however you feel about high peeps or low peeps or high volumes or low volumes, if we allow those alveoli to recruit and derecruit and recruit and derecruit, we know that that does damage. That does damage those alveoli. We get the cytokine storm and we get a lot of injury from that. And so regardless of what we are talking about in terms of our um, lung protective strategy, we know that what we don't want to do is have alveoli which are just open and shutting and open and shutting a whole bunch because we know for a fact that does damage. <clears throat> So uh, just a brief primer on the settings for APRV. You have a high pressure, a low pressure, a high time, and a low time. And those things are exactly what they sound like. So the high pressure is the maximum peak inspiratory pressure achieved during the cycle. Um, and this is the what you think of as the CPAP pressure. Typical starting P high is 20 to 25. And because of the way APRV is built, the patient can breathe over this pressure just like they can in CPAP. So you have this baseline pressure and then they're getting their tidal volume on top of that. The P low is the low or the release pressure. Um, and this is an interesting thing. It's usually set to zero to give the patient time to breathe all the way back down. So as the release times, even though they're very short, this is where the CO2 comes out. And so if you add pressure there, you potentially get in the way of CO2 coming out. Um, the T high is how long you hold the P high. That just makes the most sense in the world. And <clears throat> this is typically four to six seconds. You'll see in the example on the picture there, uh, the T high hold, or the T high in this case is 7.9, almost eight seconds. You'll see those times get longer and longer as you're trying to wean them off the ventilator because eventually you're going to take them just to longer and longer periods of lower CPAP. So that's probably what's going on in the picture there. And the T low is the duration of the release. And so this is typically very, very short. Um, uh, you'll notice there's not a rate. You will set a rate. You get the rate from how often you go to the T low, what's called the dump. Um, so, and this is just back to the math we learned in you know, first or second semester, is if you want to know what the rate is, you take the T high, you add it to the T low, that gives you the total cycle time. You divide 60 by that, and that tells you basically what your rate is, how often you're dumping. Um, so if you want to get rid of more CO2, you can either have more dumps or you can increase the T high, which increases your tidal volume. <clears throat> and then lastly, you have FiO2. This is set like FiO2 in every other mode of ventilation. <clears throat> and typically, whenever you're starting somebody on APRV, for whatever the purpose, um, you would use the same FiO2 they had previously. So. One of the things about APRV in terms of the patient who doesn't have lung injury is you use it not to treat lung injury, but to prevent it. And the idea there came from the thought that as many studies as we've done, as much thoughts we've done, and as, as far as ARDS and our, uh, or ARDSnet rather has taken us, maybe low tidal volume strategy isn't enough. Maybe you have to do something that really proactively prevents that cyclical recruitment and derecruitment. Another part of this too is that they think some of the lung injury that comes from ARDS comes from alveolar flooding, which is exactly what it sounds like. You have a bunch of fluid rushes in the alveoli, also a product of this um, recruitment and derecruitment, in addition to some capillary um, incompetence like you see with sepsis. <clears throat> if the, uh, the alveoli get flooded, 
you have a really, really important side effect to that, which you start washing away the surfactant. And surfactant takes us all the way back to the 34th week of gestation. We know that kids born before that are at risk of RDS, respiratory distress syndrome. Well, this is just acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is a new thing. There's a lot of thinking that it comes from the same thing, surfactant washout. And in the kid's case, in the baby's case, there's no surfactant there because it's not made yet. In this case, adults are washing theirs away. And so if we can preserve surfactant, then these patients tend to do better because that surfactant is seriously important to preventing that recruitment and derecruitment. It's keeping those alveolar walls slick so they don't stick together. And of all the studies which looked at APRV, a lot of those are in the context of ARDS. The handful of studies which are not in the context of ARDS, which look at healthy patients, the settings were all over the place. And one of the studies found a number of years ago that even with such a wild variation of studies, so they didn't control for the settings, the outcomes are almost always the same, is that these patients either did as well or better as they would have without APRV. So what we've learned, apparently, is that APRV is at worst as safe as and at best better than conventional ventilation when it comes to protecting the lungs. And that's what this is all about, is protecting the lungs. So what's the future of this? Um, I show you a big pretty picture of Vinant Medical Center in Greenville, North Carolina here because I consider our hospital here to be kind of leading the way on this, especially um, on the neurosurgical ICU floor, which conceivably should have nothing to do with lungs whatsoever. Every single patient up there is on APRV who's, who's on a ventilator. And that is because the physicians up there believe wholeheartedly that lung protection is the way to go. It's the way to make these patients and keep these patients safe and keep them better. So as we talk about this, we talk about the future, and we're about to talk about the very, very present and near future in just a second. Um, as we think about what the future really is for APRV, I, I really believe that future is being written here. And the studies are going to come out of this, and what I think they're going to find is that our patients who have insults outside of the thoracic cavity, so strokes, things like that, they're going to find that those patients don't have the comorbidities you might see in other patients that deal with lung injury and ventilator-induced lung injury because we're taking very, very targeted steps to keep their lungs healthy. That brings us to the bonus material that you only get this year is talking about COVID-19. I'm doing this presentation sitting in my house, not talking to my classmates because COVID-19 has knocked us out of going to school. And one of the, the big things about this is what to do with these patients when you put them on the ventilator. And I'm so excited to watch the way this literature is developing and the way that this medical experience is developing because every single day you hear physicians saying, I was wrong yesterday. And I personally find comfort in that because whenever they believe they're wrong and they learn today that they were wrong yesterday, that means they're learning and when they learn that we learn. So the early examples of this when it left from China and then from Italy and now to the United States was that we need to intubate these patients early and treat them like ARDS because they had ARDS. They had these bilateral opacities. They looked like crap. They couldn't oxygenate. It was just terrible. And we decided now that's probably not true. And this is for two reasons. Um, first reason is because we're running out of ventilators. And if we put everybody on a ventilator that we wanted to and treated them like ARDS patients, we would run out of ventilators in days, not weeks, not months, days. But now what they're finding is that if we take a second and watch these patients, maybe, just maybe, we don't have to intubate them. Maybe, just maybe, we should not intubate them. And if we do intubate them, and this is the craziest thing ever, it looks like ARDS, it acts like ARDS, but what this disease does is it turns ARDS, especially ARDSnet, right on its head. We ventilate these patients entirely differently than we did with ARDS, traditional ARDS. So one of the things they're calling this is high compliance ARDS. So they're finding when they get these patients on the ventilator, or even before then, they're measuring their compliance. And one of the hallmarks of traditional ARDS 
is terrible lung compliance. Lungs get stiff and they get inflamed, and you just can't you just can't inflate them. It takes super high pressures, super high peeps for not a lot of volume. This is exactly the opposite for these patients. They're ventilating them, and they're seeing that even though they have terrible oxygenation, that their compliance is super super high on the ventilator. So much so they've kind of dubbed this the happy hypoxemics. Um, and there's an example I'll show you. Here's a patient laying in her bed, playing on her phone. She's not intubated. You can kind of see there she is on high flow nasal cannula. And if you blow it up, you can see her oxygen saturation with a beautiful pleth is 54%. And this is very common. They're seeing this all the time with these patients is they have terrible, terrible oxygen saturations, which are confirmed by blood gases. So their PO2 is terrible. Their oxygen saturation on the blood gas is terrible. And they're perfectly fine. They're awake. They want to go home. And this is what they have dubbed the happy hypoxemic. So the way they're treating is, is first and foremost, they are not intubating them that much anymore until they really fall off the ledge. And what they're finding true is not a lot of these patients fall off the ledge. They tend to do pretty well if you support them. One of the first ways they support them, and one of the things that they're really trying to push out early, is self-proning. Self-proning is a fancy way to tell that patient to turn on their belly. Just like that girl in the picture, turn on your belly, play on your phone. Um, and then, if they do end up intubated, which we hope not, they're, they're running them on really high flows on high flow nasal cannula or traditional nasal cannula. Um, they're also doing some trial with CPAP and things like that. But if they do get intubated and get put on the ventilator, in complete contradiction to typical ARDS treatment, they're running big tidal volumes, small peeps, not high peeps, and high FiO2s. Um, one thing I heard a couple of days ago was turn the FiO2 up to 100% and leave it there until viral replication stops. And then as they get better, leave the FiO2 and slowly start turning down the PEEP, never really getting the PEEP any higher than about 12, which we know is nuts compared to what we normally do with ARDS. Um, good news, though, if you don't like this strategy, check back tomorrow. It's probably going to change. This is changing almost every day. But from what I've seen and what I've learned, this seems to be like the way we're going with COVID-19. But again, stay tuned. So our conclusion for the patient, um, he got a surgical evacuation of his intracranial hemorrhage. Um, sadly, he failed to regain neurological function. Um, so he stayed on the ventilator, was not able to wean off the ventilator. Um, he never developed lung injury or required any bronchoscopy, so he never had mucus plugs, never had anything that called his lung health into question, which is great, great news. Um, sadly, because of his neurological function, he was tricked and pegged discharged to an LTAC and, and there's where we lost him to follow up. Um, so not a super happy story, but it does illustrate how lung protective strategy, true lung protective strategy can help these patients. So APRV versus conventional ventilation, the fight's worth having, I think it is. Um, I think this is gonna spread out to other units in the hospital and hopefully to other hospitals and we'll see what a great thing this is. Um, thanks for watching email address is up there. My phone number is up there. You need anything, give me a call and I appreciate it.